Welcome to the last episode in a series where we are taking a hands-on look at how electric motors work. In this episode, we'll finally be getting into the nitty gritty of this controller. We'll be using an oscilloscope to look at the various signals inside the controller and trying to figure out what we can. This is a pretty long episode as I'm covering a lot of topics in one hit. I did consider bringing it up into a series of shorter videos, but decided against this in the end. Even so, there are multiple sections inside this video and each of the topics are as follows. 1. Planning and setup for the tests. 2. Fixing a problem inside the main controller board. 3. Looking at how the IR2101 chip converts the high and low control signals. 4. A full capture and stack up of all the control and motor signals, along with some detailed analysis. 5. A look at how this controller is using PWM to adjust the motor's power. 6. A look at how the controller achieves the braking effect. 7. A look at what return signals are sent back to the microcontroller from the motor. 8. Finally I will work to figure out how the controller determines the motor's position without the use of sensors. Now naturally I would prefer you watch the whole video as this provides a much better context that way, but for those of you who want to, feel free to skip around and watch any of the sections that interest you. So enough of my waffle, let's get straight into it. Alright so we've got this thing all cleaned up as you can see, I think it turned out pretty good for something that was pretty burnt nice and crispy. You can still see a bit of the damage under the board there, but I don't think it's going to cause any problems. I did do some checks and uh, everything seemed to be okay. So I think we're ready to go. But before we get into actually doing the uh, the testing, there's a few things we have to do first. And one is actually talk about, well, what are we going to test for? What are we going to look at? So I made up this little list here so you can see the objectives. So the first thing that I'm interested in looking at is these uh, IR2101 chips, right? So they are actually a buffer or a interface chip between the uh, microcontroller and the the MOSFETs uh, gate control signals. So we discussed that in the first video in quite some detail, but we didn't actually look at any signals. So I want to have a look at what the signals look like before and after this uh, IR2101 chip. And the second thing I want to look at is I want to have a look at the um, have a look at what the control signals, and we'll look at them at at the microcontroller side and compare them with what we're seeing on each of the phases of the motors themselves so we can see what sort of relationship there is between the control signal and the actual uh, voltage switching that we're actually seeing or the voltages that we're seeing on the motor phases. And next up we're going to take a look at um, how the PWM control is applied. So I'm pretty sure um, given that if we look at the manual here it says here, I didn't know what it meant when I first uh, was working on the melee it says it can be set for 8 kilohertz or 16 kilohertz uh, PWM so this is indi indicative to me that this is uh, for the speed control of the motor um, so it's a PWM type uh, not a linear type control obviously uh, to control the speed of the motor so what I'm likely expecting to see is that the low side is probably constantly always on or off and likely the high side is where we're doing the uh, PWM switching um, to see to control the speed and that's going to be similar to what you saw in my last episode where I, I did something like that as well uh, so my assumption is that's what it's going to be and uh, we're going to check that out so next up uh, obviously how the brake is applied um, I haven't done any research on this so I'm, I really am just talking off the top of my head but my assumption is is that um, some of the phases are just going to be kept on at a certain level um, so if we look at this sheet here as well we can see that there's the option for no brake, soft brake, medium brake, and hard brake. So that indicates to me that likely some uh, degree of power application just solidly held on on one or, or a pair of the phases. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and depending on the the degree or the setting that you're using here, um, you'll probably see a different level of uh, the PWM duty cycle being applied. That, that's my suspicion. So. We'll take a look at that and see if we can understand what's going on with that. And next up is here, where, what is the motor position sensing? Now as we discussed in the last episode, we to control uh, the phase switching here, uh, we need to know really whereabouts the motor is in its rotation. And so this is a senseless type uh, arrangement, so there's no sensor coming back in, so it has to take um, some information from the motor phases um, and the movement of those motor phases uh, acting as a generator, generating a voltage basically. So obviously 
that information somehow has to get to here. And I've had a bit of a look here and I've got a rough idea what's going on, but we'll talk about that in some more detail later. And finally, we'll just take a look just to see if we can account for all of the IOs that's on the, um, that's on the microcontroller here. And that's about it. I think there's nothing uh, too complicated. Uh, but to do the testing, um, we are going to be using a uh, oscilloscope. So what I'm going to need to do is we're going to need to try to identify where we want to test and apply some test leads to here. So we'll be doing that coming up now. So let's get to it. So to test the MOSFET buffer chip input and output signals to see how they're being uh, adapted, um, I already checked the data sheet and I know that um, here is the inputs, input for the high side and input for the low side. And on the output side, uh, we have the output for the high side. You can see that wiggling around here for the high side. And over here is the low side. And this is probably dumping behind a, a via and then uh, coming out over to here, I suspect. I mean, we can buzz that out just to be sure. So let's just do that. So this should be the low side. And yeah, there it is there. So here to here for the low side, and this is the, the high side. So while we're here, let's try to identify where these control input signals are coming from, uh, from this microcontroller. And I have a have made a little diagram here, which uh, has all of the I's and O's. And what I'll do is I'll just write down on this diagram where those control signals are coming from. Let's get to buzzer mode. So this is high for phase A, we'll call it. That second one there. And the low. That's what I thought. So it's low, high. And next. So the third one there. We can assume that going to be right next door probably or not other side second pin so it's that first pin there right I'm sure it's a rhyme or reason to why they've located them in these ports on the other side here now yeah Third pin. So now we know where all those go to, and on the outside here, uh, we have high, low, A, high, low, B, and then high, low, C for the control side. So from the motor phase, uh, we assume we can see that here. If we can get that on focus here, uh, there's a voltage divider here. This is our earth line which I've already buzzed out earlier. And there's a voltage divider here. What do we got there, folks? 47K and 4.7K. So it's dividing, so it's about one tenth of the, the voltage here. So we can see here the output of the voltage divider coming around and then going to suspiciously these three sets of uh, 47k resistors and these are all bridged together here and are going in to one of these inputs which will buzz out in a second and we can see that's repeated for the other uh, two phases as well so this is identical and they all the output of the voltage divider all winds up here at this 47k and combines to have a single combined sense so it takes the uh, three dot voltage dividers and it provides a common sense um, but from there, we can see there's these little vias here, one, uh, and there's another two vias here, and they flip around and terminate. You can see here these four holes, these four holes from the vias, and then there's these one, two, three, and they shoot around here, all three of these, to this other side these three here and going into these ports here so what we have is a situation where 
the each of the individual phases have a voltage divided or voltage lowered you could say uh, version of the uh, of each of the motor phases being fed back into the um, microcontroller here separately and then there's a combined version of that as well being fed into the microcontroller so I'm not sure exactly why they're doing that I think there's the battery voltage sense here which is being done via a voltage divider I think this might be it right here right? you see these two resistors 47k and uh, something much bigger <laughs> 8 that gives me two more just 300k am I right guys I think I'm right so that would make sense if that's a voltage divider so I think this will be the negative and I suspect this is going to the positive of the battery and it looks like they've got a condenser a capacitor on here to settle it down a little bit and I expect this here right it's going into here and that'll be where they're sensing the voltage and then there's this loose little baby here which I really don't know what that is now there's a whole lot of other stuff here as well you can just take a bit of a look uh, so these two there's three right looks like should be some something going on here so this looks like it's not populated should be resistors or something here right so we can assume that all of these uh, one two three I think these are all like future use or dead ports so we'll put a little cross on that and then we see something similar here as well so these are probably all dead ports I expect or maybe they put test signals out there so they can diagnose problems or something like that so for the uh, for the motor control side of things uh, we have here this a h and a l and then we have the b high and the b low and then the c high and the c low we also have the sense for the a and the sense for the b which i've managed to forget to write and the sense for the c and we have the combined version of those signals coming into there as well and the battery voltage sense appeared to be going in here so hopefully I've got the right chip here and these IOs are written the right way we can sort of see what sort of ports are using so port D so 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 uh, 0 and 1 so port D is pretty heavily used and then for the three phase sensors here we have port C being used
So there it is, I think, assuming it gets in focus. So on this side, we have all of the uh, high and low control signals coming from the microcontroller, which we can test. And here we have the three return signals coming from the motor after it's been voltage divided. Here's the combined signal. And then on this side, uh, we have each of the motor phases, obviously, we can pick up and the, uh, the high and low control signals that go to the actual MOSFETs. Okay, so that's ready to go. Well, let's start doing some testing and see what we can learn. Okay, so unfortunately we're back at my rework bench and I was just tidying up a couple of these uh, test points here that I wasn't happy with and retesting them to make sure I hadn't shorted anything out given they're pretty close together. And just by chance as I was skipping through, I had managed to, sh to test between the motor phase C and the this point here. And notice that it's a very low um, resistance, it's like 8 ohms, which is basically a short. So, you know, that's actually uh, not the pin next to it. The pin next to it is not shorted at all. So the short isn't related to my soldering work, which is a good thing. Um, so it has to be something else. And looking at the circuit diagram, um, we know this is the motor phase C, uh, which is coming back into this board so it can get the motor position and also get the voltage reference for the uh, high-low uh, conversion that's done by this uh, IR2101 chip. So it basically goes to this IR2101 chip and the, uh, the high control signal that is sent to the MOSFET is coming out of this chip and they're actually next to each other on this pin here. So the likely candidate for the problem area is related to this chip and we can also see here that Yeah, so these two pins look like they're shorted, but there's no shorting that I can see on the board. So I suspect there's something wrong with this chip itself. And uh, so we're going to have to swap this chip out and see if that solves the problem. Obviously taking the chip off, we can then check the chip off the board and make sure that the chip is actually still showing that same uh, problem. Uh, looking at some of these other chips, these are all identical. Obviously they should all read the same. We're not seeing that short state. In fact, this is basically open and open. And I have another one of these boards here as well. And if we check the same again, which is here and here, yeah, we can see it's not showing that same symptom. So it's rather peculiar. Now I actually then uh, ran this ESC controller up and, uh, and ran it on a motor and just had a quick look on the oscilloscope. And uh, unsurprisingly enough, yeah, it's not a, a behavior of the chip or anything like that. The signal we're seeing on the phase and uh, high-low control signal were actually basically shorted. It's the same signal, whereas the other uh, channels were showing differing signals. So I'm pretty confident, I would say I'm 90% confident, which is pretty confident. So I'll take one of these IR2100 chips off here and uh, put it over here. So it's turning a bit into a uh, curious mark type video, unfortunately. So we're going to have to try and solve the problems as we go. But I think after we do this, it'll all be okay. So let's get to it anyway. My little solder bridge is gone. Oh, I can hear the poppy, poppy, pop. That's a good sign. We can get enough height. I have to get a little bit of the liveliness back into that solder. I mean, as you can see, the big ball of solder is now bridging onto the board, which is not really well, not what we want. If I angle it this way a bit, we can get gravity to work for us a little bit. Hopefully we can wick it out a bit. And it'll little disappear. Come on. There we go. Free with minimal damage to the chip. Well, it doesn't matter because this chip is dead anyway. Quality camera work there, guys. Here we go. And she's gone. Now, the big question we all had is if that chip was actually bad or if there's something wrong with this board. Let me just clean these pads up while I'm at it here. Ah, beautiful. No damage whatsoever. And, yeah, so this pin here should be the signal to control the high side MOSFETs. And this is the return signal for the float. Or... I've got the chip flipped there in there. Oh, no, there it is, 8 ohms. Yeah, so the chip is dead as a doornail. C 
see if we can get this to all get happy. Oh no. We're gonna go that easy, was it? And the camera is in the way of the soldering iron. It really is, guys. Trust me. Oh, that looks done. Yeah, I might get him. Might my might get my glass out in a minute and just check it because you guys are going to be able to see that a lot better than I can on your big screen. Oh, look at that. There's no way I'm going to get in there with that camera in the way. Angle it down a little bit. Bit of down pressure because it's not going to move now with that other side all locked in place. So as long as you don't have too much solder in the mix, you can definitely get away with just using this uh, wedge. Let's see if we can get this into focus. Mm-hmm. What do you reckon? Is there enough? Okay, so here's the test setup. I'm using a radio controller again to control the speed uh, and provide this, the PWM control speed signal here. I've actually just got, try not to knock anything over here, the receiver here off screen, powered by a 5 volt supply. And we have our motor, which is the same one I use in the mini lathe. And even though we're only using a single MOSFET board here and no, no heat sink, it's really not an issue because we're not really driving any load on this motor. It's only just spinning around there so it doesn't get hot or anything like that. And I'm using a power supply, a normal lab power supply, to provide the, uh, the power in to, to drive the motor. And then I've got my 20-year-old, uh, so old, 4-channel uh, digital oscilloscope. And that thing's really showing its age a bit. Uh, at the time when it was purchased, probably worth about as much as a good uh, family sedan, maybe about twenty to forty thousand um, dollars. But compared to even you know a few hundred dollar oscilloscope today, uh, you know the performance is not all that great. Actually, it's it's uh, it's showing its age, and it shows you how technology moves on. But even so, it's still quite useful. And um, as my uh, Hentec two hundred dollar oscilloscope uh, only has two channels because I cheaped out. Uh, I'm going to be using this one here, which has four channels, and give us a bit of better view and make it a bit easier to do this testing. So first off, we're going to do that uh, MOSFET uh, buffer chip signals, which is apt because we just ended up having to uh, replace this uh, chip here. So we're going to take a look at the signals. Uh, so the red wire here is the input signal for the high, the high signal, and the black signal here is the low signal. Now I wanted to say before we moved on is that, you know, if you haven't watched episode one before watching this one, then go and watch episode one first because it really goes into the detail of how this um, how this chip is all laid, how this um, ESC is all laid out, and it'll provide a good foundation for what you're seeing in this video. I mean, obviously, if you want to just uh, wing it and and have a look, that's fine too. But highly recommend you to check that video first because I don't want to be re-explaining everything again to everyone who's already seen that first video. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. So anyway, yep, uh, the red is the uh, high signal coming in from the uh, microcontroller and the uh, black is the low signal. Now we have channels A, B and C. I'm going to look at channel uh, C here. Uh, the, the A, B and C is just an arbitrary name I'm giving them because we need to call them something. Um, and then the signals that go to control the actual MOSFETs are here um, and they're in the same order. So this pin here, this pin here is the high control signal, which was uh, 8 ohms before, before we fixed it. And uh, here is the uh, low signal. And this is the signal of the motor phase itself, which is being fed back into the system so it can control it. So we're only interested in looking at what this chip here does, this IR2101 chip does. So we'll be looking at the signals that go into it from the microcontroller, the high and low signals. And we'll be having a look at the signals that come out of it. Now, as we saw uh, in the first episode, the expectation is that the low signal here will be simply converted to being a, a, a 12 volt uh, logic style. So it's coming in as 5 volt logic coming in from here and going out as 12 volts. And that 12 volts is because it's provided by this MAX 662 chip, which is generating the 12 volt rail uh, as a reference or to supply these chips here. So, yeah, so basically, yeah, we expect to see this coming in as 5 volt logic and coming out as 12 volt logic and for the for the red wire here for the high side 
we expect it to be become a floating logic um, with a 12 volt range so it will be floating on top of uh, whatever the voltage we see here on, on this uh, phase so this phase is fed back into the chip and it floats the high low control signal on here and that ensures that the MOSFET is always switched on as we discussed in the first episode so I'm already re-explaining myself but anyway such is life so is there anything else here to, to discuss uh, I guess the only other thing just is we can quickly identify if there is a PWM signal uh, being used in either of these uh, signals which I'm, I'm absolutely sure there is and whether that PWM signal is applied to both uh, high and low signals or if it's only applied to the high or only high to the low um, you know my gut feel said it was the high but there's no reason it couldn't be the low either so but you know that would become clear as we run it up so let's spin the motor up here and make sure it's working yeah we're going to hear that brake being applied as well and we'll get to looking at the brake a little bit later so we'll start off by looking at this uh, high signal here first and we're going to use that uh, well, it doesn't matter which one, but we'll say we're going to try and use this uh, high signal here, or the input signal, as the trigger, trigger signal for the scope. So all of the timing uh, for the oscilloscope will be locked to this input here, and we'll look at the other uh, signals relative to the timing position of this. Uh, so let's spin it up and uh, get the scope set up. Now I'm going to use the auto set here on the scope just to get us in the ballpark and there we have it I'll widen this scale up here so we have a 2 volt scale yes yeah, so it's a uh, 2 4 and 1 volt so 5 volt range so there we go for 5 volt logic that we're getting out of the microcontroller and I'll drop the scale a little bit here so we can wedge in those other signals so that's the uh, high signal so next up on channel 2 let's go straight to looking at that conversion of the high signal to the uh, to the floating 12 volt logic which we should expect to see make sure we'll clip on to that high there we go and I'll turn that on yeah that's quite large let me drop it down a little bit there we go and we'll get a little bit more information to so add some measurements for channel 2 for now what do we got? Uh, amplitude, that'll do. Uh, actually, let me remove that measurement. We'll start off on channel one, and uh, measurement channel one, amplitude, just because it's in the same line here, make it easy to read. And then channel two, and we'll add amplitude, and we'll clear the menu, and there we go. So we can see here that the uh, amplitude for the microcontroller signal is at five volt uh, rail, it's just 5.6, but there's going to be a bit of noise, etc. on that. And then we're seeing the amplitude on the output side uh, of the conversion of that IR2101 chip to be about 24 volts. And that makes a lot of sense um, because at the lowest end of the scale, obviously, we have the zero volts. And I'm running this motor here at 11.9 or 12 volts. So basically, we have the 12 volts of the of the power supply. So when that uh, high side MOSFET closes, it's gonna go up to 12 volts. And at that stage, the floating voltage for the logic for the on state, which we wanna hold as an on state, is gonna add the 12 volts created by that, uh, my finger in the motor, by that 662 chip. So, you know, naturally we're gonna see 24 volts. So that makes a lot of sense. So this is the point where it's being switched on and we can see here that it's basically just being switched on so it's going to full on and then in these other areas in the off state we also see it floating around here and that's because the phase is actually changing in voltage in the off state as well so in the off state you know we have other phases affecting this phase and we have the the generation factor the fact that the motor is spinning and generating some uh, voltages uh, in the phase as well we can see that not only is the, the high state of the switching floating but the low side is also floating. And we'll just take a quick look at the phase itself so we can compare what the, the motor phase is actually doing, see how that looks compared to the, to the, uh, to the floating value. Let me put that on channel three for a second. That's not what I wanna do, but I'll do that just for a second. Let's turn channel three on. So that's what channel three is actually doing. And let's measure it as well. So yeah, it's uh, peak to peak 13 uh, volts or something like that. And so here we can see it's basically tracking. And if we go to the same scale and then we move it on top here, we can see there, right? 
basically the off state is, is tracking the voltage of the motor phase and in the on state we're getting that plus 12 volt logic being added onto the off state here so yeah everything makes a lot of sense so i think we've got that pretty much cleared up so now let's take a look at the the low side of things so let's uh, pop off this motor phase here and have a look at the input signal first hopefully not get this tangled up in there there we go and we'll change the scale we keep it the wrong way five volt so five volt logic I don't see anything which is weird. Am I actually on it? Am I losing my mind? What's going on? Oh, I'm not on it. There we go. Okay, so on the input side, um, we see something quite interesting. First is we see that this is all white here. So this is indicative that it's actually PWM on the low side of things. So the logic signal is, is uh, PWM here. So let's move that move everything up a little bit for a second get things so we get a little bit more space and again five volt logic uh, what we're going to see on the channel four when we turn it on on the output side of the chip for the low side buffering is it's just going to be switched to 12 volt logic so let's just check it out and uh, we'll be done with that let's keep sticking my finger in that motor that's pretty stupid stupid oh no i'm not leaving myself a lot of space here to work it's all for you guys right there we go so, oh. So the, uh, there we go, the low side signal control. Let's take a look at that, turn it on. Instead of getting cursors or anything, we'll again add a measurement for channel four, amplitude, and surprise, surprise, it's that uh, Max 662 chips uh, 12 volt amplitude. So, you know, really, this is an unnecessary conversion in some ways. Um, I mean, it guarantees that you're gonna have enough voltage there to make sure that the, uh, the MOSFET fully switches on, but I think for 99.99% of MOSFETs, you're probably gonna achieve that at the five volts anyway, so uh, whatever, right? Anyway, that's what it does. It, it, at least it's providing a protection layer between the MOSFETs and the microcontroller. And uh, so if something does go wrong with the MOSFET and it's gonna blow something up, it's probably gonna blow up these buffer chips, which is in fact what we saw uh, with one of those chips already dying. Okay, this is future me popping back here to have a look at these uh, signal conversion through this IR2101 chip. Now, you've just seen uh, the basic idea of how those signals are looking, but as I was sort of getting a little bit more re-familiarized with this uh, oscilloscope, I remembered there's obviously mathematic functions. So I thought it'd be a good idea to use those functions. And let's take a look at the high side MOSFET is seeing from its point of view. So, you know, if we look at this signal here, I'll run it up. This is just the high side conversion that we're looking at. On the top here we have the 5 volt logic signal and we have the converted signal which is the floating signal and we have the signal that is actually coming uh, out of the motor on that motor's phase. So this is what it's floating on. You know this signal here is actually, it's not VGS, it's not voltage uh, compared to gate and source on the MOSFET. It's voltage compared to the gate and zero volts. But that's not what the MOSFET itself is seeing. What the MOSFET's going to see is the VGS. So to create a simulated uh, VGS or have a look at it from the uh, MOSFET's point of view, we really need to subtract uh, this voltage here because this voltage here is the voltage that's on the, the source. It's actually on that leg of the source pin. If we subtract that from here, we will actually have a look at what the signal looks like from the uh, MOSFET's point of view. So let's do that. We'll do some maths. Maybe change mass waveform definition, okay. A dual waveform mass, here we go. Set operator to negative, set first source to channel two, and we'll subtract channel three, okay. Oh, there it is. Let's see if we can get it into view and clear the screen, increase the scale. Oh, there she go, there it is. So there you have what the VGS will look like from the MOSFET's point of view. Okay, so let's get into having a look at those control signals for all of the channels and hopefully see uh, what the motor phases are also doing at the same time. Now, I'm not really sure how many things I can show on the screen at the same time for this oscilloscope. It's only a four channel scope, so obviously we can't show, I think there's a total of two, four, six, yeah, nine signals that we really wanna see on the screen at the same time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run it up, I'm gonna save a few of the waveforms 
and see if I can stack them in this display so that we can see everything running at the same time. I should be able to at least get two more on the screen, so in the worst case we're going to see the six control signals and see what they're doing. Uh, in the best case we'll be able to also see the, uh, the motor signals as well. Maybe there. We'll move the trigger so it goes back a little bit. Trigger position, 5%. So we can see the first and the last. And we can see the PWM coming here. So let's save this waveform now that we've got this sorted out. Save. We can recall ref1. And there we go. Should be enough there for us to figure this out. All right, so this is the tricky bit, trying to figure out what all of these signals mean. Now in the first video in the series, I discussed the basic switching mechanism for this ESC. I also used a diagram with a delta style windings as a demonstration, along with notes saying that there are other types of windings which are used. Actually, this diagram was a little bit wrong, as I only showed the current flowing through one of the coils and the windings, but of course the current will flow through the other two coils as well. But naturally this is only going to be at half the rate, given there is double the resistance in this part of the circuit. It was also seemingly wrong of me to imply that this delta style winding would work with this type of centralist ESC. It won't. I should have shown a Y style winding instead. Let me explain why with this simple diagram. In the case of Y style windings, as shown here, if we energise between points 1 and 3, then only calls A and C will be energised to push the motor. Call B is basically free to act as a generator as the magnets approach and recede, and this voltage is output at point 2. It's this generated voltage which is critical to the sensing of the rotor's position, and fundamental to how the back EMF sensorless mechanism works. In the case of delta windings, no matter how you power the motor, a solid voltage is always going to be present at each wire of the motor. And naturally that's going to make any voltage generating effect much more difficult to detect. Now my misunderstanding in the first video was driven from the fact that many internet forums seem to indicate that Y and delta windings are pretty much interchangeable, and none of them I saw really mentioned any concern about this sensorless positioning issue. So the lesson here, treat any information you see on the internet forums with a grain of salt. Actually I normally do, but I'll let my guard down here a little bit. So after a little bit more searching, I did find an interesting IEEE study document, and it was discussing possible strategies for sensorless position sensing using delta windings. Right at the start of this document, it clearly states that senseless brushless motors are typically wound with the Y style configuration. And it also states that that's because an unpowered phase is required to detect the back EMF signal. Now I didn't read all the document, but the key takeaway was that senseless motors typically use Y style windings. So for this video, we're going to stick to looking at motors with Y style windings and leave delta versus Y issues for another day. So with all that said, let's take a look at those signals we just captured. Now up until now I've been calling those motor wire connections as phases A, B and C, but I'm going to switch that to calling them wire connections 1, 2 and 3 from here on, so I hope it doesn't confuse anyone. Instead I'll use the A, B and C to identify each of the coils inside the motor windings. So with a quick look at this capture, we can see a sequence of six uh, unique events that are continuously repeating to drive the motor. The top three signals here indicate if a positive voltage is being applied to the wire, with the next three signals indicating when a negative voltage is applied to the wire. By negative I mean zero volts, ground or whatever you like to call it. The last three signals shown here are the voltages as we measure at each individual motor wire. Effectively the controller has a tri-state control of each of the individual motor wires, and this allows for setting each wire as either being positive or negative voltage, or alternatively not applying any voltage to the wire at all. So you just need to keep that in mind when looking at the voltages that we see at the motor wires themselves. If we look at this first event for example, we can see that the wire 1 is connected to the positive constantly, and that wire 3 is quickly cycling between negative and being disconnected. That cycling is the PWM method being used to control the amount of power that is being pumped into the coil in the motor. So in this case, each time that wire 3 is pulled down, energy is being dumped into coils A and C. We can also see that wire 2 is disconnected for the duration of the event. So it's pretty easy for us to understand the voltage we are seeing at wires 1 and 3. But what about the voltage that we are seeing at Y2? What should we expect to see there? Well effectively coils A and C will act as a 50% voltage divider. It's just the same as if you had two same size resistors running in series. So let's just pretend that these coils are not actually in a spinning motor for a minute. 
When the wire 3 is not pulling down, we would expect wire 2 just to show the same voltage as provided by wire 1, of course. But when wire 3 is pulling down, we would expect wire 2 to pull down to 50% of the voltage. In theory, it would look something like this, right? But if we take a look at the actual capture signals from the motor, we see something that looks quite a bit different from this. At first, we see a full positive volt, which then eventually ramps down to something like that 50% pulse signal we had originally theorized about. So let me try to explain why we see this difference. Even though we can't measure it, the voltage at the center of the Y will in fact be that 50% PWM signal. But as the magnets approach and recede from coil B, additional positive or negative voltage is generated. And that causes the voltage on wire 2 to either rise up or drop down a bit. So at first we see additional positive voltage being induced into coil B, and this appears to be enough to cause some type of saturation that absolutely wipes out the negative component of the PWM pulses. But then as the rotor position advances, the generation effect subsides, and we start to see that half-sized pulses returning to the nominal level that we originally expected. In the second event, we see something a little bit different, but the underlying effect is much the same. In this case, we see a negative voltage is first being generated, pulling the pulses down towards zero volts, before they return back to their nominal level. At least with this event, we can confirm that the half-height pulses are in fact present for the duration of the event, even though the DC level changes a bit. In both of these cases, the timing that the voltage either rises or falls is going to be directly linked to the position of the rotor. So I think it's going to be a pretty safe bet to say that this is what is being used to detect the motor's position. In fact, we can see that the timing of the switching is always occurring just as the voltage generation effect seems to subside. Look, right here, the switching events always occur just as the pulses get back to that nominal 50% level. What's also really obvious with this is that there's really no way to know the motor's position unless the motor is actually rotating, generating that back EMF signal. I guess that explains the jumpy starts we see with these type of motors at times. There's also another conundrum here that needs to be addressed. As you can see, these back EMF signals are pretty messy, with all that PWM garbage mixed in there. And it's not immediately obvious to me how the microcontroller could easily interpret them. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Later in the video, we will take some time to try to figure out what that all means and how that all works. For now, I want to focus on the powering sequence of the coils and how that relates to getting the motor to actually spin. Now, just looking at the captured waveform here, it's a bit hard to visualize what is actually happening in each of these six events. So I've created this little diagram which directly takes each of the events and shows how the coils are being energized along with the position of the rotor itself. Now hopefully I've interpreted this correctly. Even if I've got a little bit wrong, the basic concept should not be far off in any case. So I, I think it's meaningful no matter what. This motor I'm showing has 14 magnets in the rotor and 12 coils in the stator, wound in a typical pattern for this style of motor. I'm using uppercase letters for the coils wound clockwise and lowercase letters for coils wound counterclockwise. And actually these opposing winding directions are going to generate opposing polarity magnetic fields when the motor's running. Now to be honest, I'm not bothered to figure out what exactly might be north or south magnetic poles in this diagram. And for this discussion, it's just simply not important. Just as long as we can identify where like and opposite poles exist. And at the same time, keep in mind that opposite poles are going to attract and like poles are going to repel. To this end, we will just stick to calling these opposing poles as being red and blue poles for the discussion and try to avoid any backlash in the comments, which I'm sure I would get if I get it wrong. Here on the right side, I'm going to show how the coils will be energized with each event uh, with motor wires 1, 2 and 3, along with coils A, B and C shown. As per the waveform, uh, the first step has wire 1 being positive and wire 3 being negative, and wire 2 is not connected in either way. And to try to keep it simple, I'm going to ignore the PWM component for now, so negative is just negative in this diagram. Positive is shown is orange, negative is black, and white is not connected. The electrons flowing from a negative input towards the center of the wire results in the coil giving a blue magnetic field, just as we see here for coil C. And the electrons flowing from the center of the wire towards the positive input gives us the opposite red magnetic field, just as we see here for coil A. On the left side of the diagram, we can see that the outer rotator has 14 magnets, each placed side by side with alternating polarity. We can also see which coils in the stator are being energized and with what polarity that is. You'll also notice the lowercase character always follows the same uppercase character, but with the opposite polarity. The unpowered coils are always shown in white, and while not shown in this diagram, the voltage present on the floating wire, in this case wire number two, will change as the magnets approach and recede from that unpowered coil. So I think I've got the rotor and stator positioned correctly here. Something that is immediately striking in this design is the fact that there is a different number of coils compared to the number of magnets. 
There's simply no physical way for all the coils and magnets to face each other at the same time in this design. But why have they done that? Let's focus in here at the bottom, where we have a capital A in red. Here we can see it's nearly directly opposite the same polarity magnet. Now we know from our experiments in a prior episode that this is where the repelling forces is going to be the greatest. But we also know the magnet would be happy to fly off in either direction too. You can't really predict which way it's going to go. And now if we look at the following three coils, again we can see each of them are facing a like pole. But in this case the permanent magnet is located more and more shifted clockwise as we progress around. Naturally, as these coils and magnets move further and further out of alignment, the repelling forces are going to get weaker and weaker. So this A coils alignment is causing the maximum repelling force, but it's likely not directional. However, the following coils are all clearly pushing in the clockwise direction, even though the force is actually a little bit lower. But the net result is, is that by combining all of these forces together, we can be guaranteed of a powerful clockwise rotation. Now we only focused on the lower half of this motor so far, but if we take a look at the upper half too, we can see that the exact same forces are at play, albeit the polarities are all reversed. To sum this all up, the unequal number of coils and permanent magnets we have here ensures that the rotor and stator could never be aligned to have a non-directional teetering point. It ensures that the net forces can always be biased to rotate one way or the other. And having this consistent mix of forces should also allow the motor to run smoother across a wider range of speeds. So I think you get the general idea. Let's now step through each of these events and see how it works overall. Now as we start to rotate towards the second event, we can get some idea of how the permanent magnets would be inducing voltages into that coil B. And then as we hit event 2, coil A stays energised, just as it was before, but coil C now switches off and coil B takes on the blue polarity. After the switch, we can see the same type of alignment of forces are maintained, continuing to push the motor in a clockwise direction. So let's keep going. And event 3, event 4, event 5, and finally event 6. I think with that you can see a couple of reoccurring patterns here. The first is the order that the wires are being energised in. You can see a given wire always keeps its state across two consecutive events. But since the positive and negative switching timings are offset by one event, this results in a sort of tag team handover across six unique events. The second thing to note is the pattern of the coil's energisation, which is remaining the same as it moves around the motor. It actually looks like it's chasing the rotor. It sort of reminds me of a kid who is running alongside of a hoop, pushing it along as he goes. All right, so there you have it. Let's get on to the next bit. So next up, we're gonna take a look at the PWM signal and see how it's being applied in this motor. Uh, so let's rev up the motor. Now you can see the little packages of PWM pulses uh, for the low side switching of, uh, I'm actually looking at uh, phase A here. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see this consists of all the PWM pulses. And let's take a quick measurement here uh, with the cursor to check the frequency. So from here to here, 16 kilohertz. And that matches up pretty well with the, uh, the setting that we see here. 16 kilohertz uh, is the, probably the default setting given this, what it says there. Uh, obviously you can use eight kilohertz as well, but uh, you know, obviously that's gonna reduce the number of pulses per package. And at some of the higher speeds, you're actually gonna get quite a, quite a rough sort of uh, cutoff, I guess, of the package of pulses and the pulses themselves. You can see here, well, it's a bit difficult to see, but actually the first pulse is actually being cut off. So the pulses are not actually timed with the frequency of the motor, it can't be. So the first pulse is sort of chopped up a bit and then the rest of the pulses remain complete. And then likely the tail pulse also gets chopped off a bit. So if the frequency was too low, then it really starts to clash heavily with the, uh, the, the package of pulses as well. So it'll get quite chunky and, and could actually become quite unstable at, in some situations. But so anyway, 16 kilohertz seems to make a lot of uh, sense for this. And if we have a look at how the PWM is working, as we increase the speed, we can see that um, the size of the pulse or the duty cycle is increasing. That means that power is being applied longer. Uh, more power is being applied during the, 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 the package of pulses. And that makes the motor run faster, obviously. And as we reduce slower, uh, the duty cycle is reduced and the uh, less power is being applied between each package of pulses and obviously the motor is going to run slower. We can also see here that uh, regardless, so we see here that the timing, 16 kilohertz, regardless of the of the speed um, or the way the power is applied, 
the frequency remains solid at 16 kilohertz so that that is not a changing factor but if we look at the package of pulses we can see that the frequency that the package pulse follows along with the speed and that is exactly what's happening is that these this power is being applied uh, in synchronization with the with the speed of the motor itself and the amount of power being applied is by the size of the duty cycle uh, of each of the pulses in that pulse train. To go faster, the duty cycle would increase, applying more power, making the motor go a bit faster, and therefore the, the speed increases and the frequency of the pulse train also increases. I've already had a bit of a look at what's going on here and I noticed that after the brake is applied all of these uh, high signals uh, are not coming into play, they stay off. So really only the low signals controls are being active to some degree at the braking. So I'm only looking at the high side for phase A and then channels 2, 3 and 4 are looking at the uh, low side uh, for A, B and C. And that's what we've got on the screen here. And you can already see there that in the stopped state, phases uh, A, B, C, low side is in the high state, so it's switched on. So all three of the uh, phases have been switched to zero volts. And uh, the high side switching, they're all inactive, so nothing's been switched to voltage. So in effect, there's no voltage being applied when the brake is applied. All it's doing is shorting out all of the coils to ground. And it's that effect which is causing this, this sort of braking effect. Uh, the fact that by spinning this you're trying to generate current but that's basically all shorted out and that's the braking effect you get so yeah that's interesting now there are three modes here for the braking which is no brake soft brake and hard brake now the no brake is just going to see nothing switch basically we're not going to see this uh these phases all being locked together and the soft medium and hard brake is more about the the speed that the brake is being applied. So right now I've set it to soft brake, and if you watch when I speed up and then drop it down, you'll see that it takes a little while for the PWM to cease uh, being present on the low side uh, control pulses before they all just simply go active and short out all those phases. So let's take a look at that. So here we go. A, B, and C are all doing their things. This is uh, A high. A, B, C are uh, all looking at the low switching or switching to zero volts and they're doing their cyclical thing and then once we slam the brake on you'll see that it hangs around for a little while and then it all goes active so it basically shorts out all of those uh, phases to, to zero volts probably not the best trigger because when I when I shut it down this is currently triggering to uh, yeah, let's see if I can change up the triggering a little bit so that we are triggering to channel 2. Alright, let me speed it up. The G cycle is increasing and brake. And you can see, yeah, look at that. You can see the uh, brake being applied slowly. Hmm. One more time. And all of the phases are being applied right. So this is uh, cyclical with the phase switching, but when I hit brake, all the phases go into that braking mode state. So let's, uh, let's switch things up again, and uh, I think we'll go straight to hard brake and see how quickly that changes. So let me change the setting. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Okay, that'll do. Okay, settings done. Let's check out what the brake looks like now. Let's go. You ready? And brake. Oh yeah, it's basically gone nearly immediately. Okay, so we just saw that by shorting out all the motor's phases, we can cause a braking effect. In fact, if you short out the wires of a motor just like this, you can clearly feel the braking effect. To be honest, this is not how I originally had imagined the braking mechanism would work. I did not have a good idea of what was going on here. And just before I go on with this explanation, it's probably important just to make sure that everyone here watching knows that most electric motors will behave as electric generators when they are spun in an unpowered state. So anyway, after pondering it all for a while, I could only think it must be related to this electric generator effect, but it wasn't immediately obvious why. I mean, if the motor is stopped like this, 
then it should not be generating any power anyway. So how could that even work? I also thought about my own experience with gasoline electric generators. Applying higher and higher current loads to a gasoline generator causes it to want to slow down more and more. Of course, most generators will auto throttle to compensate, but just by the sound, you can really tell when a generator is working hard to compensate. It's clearly pushing back on some sort of physical load. So how does this all relate to the braking effect we see here? Well, I think most people know that causing a short in a circuit is actually creating the maximum possible load condition, a condition that allows the current to flow at the fastest possible rate. Well, at least until something melts, that is. So by shorting out all the wires on the motor, we are just creating an extremely high load condition. And just as the same as we see with a gasoline generator, the motor will want to slow down in response to the load applied. There's another common experiment that has a similar effect to this motor braking effect. If you drop a magnet down a long copper tube, instead of just falling out the bottom quickly, the magnet slowly moves down the tube, like some type of magic force is slowing its fall. Do a quick internet search and check it out yourself. There are a couple of videos covering this experiment, and they're quite interesting to see. So what's happening here is, as the magnet moves down the pipe, it's inducing a current into a localized area in the pipe. And similar to shorting the wires of the motor, the copper pipe behaves as a short circuit, which in turn results in extremely high current load. And it's this high current load state that causes the magnet to slow down, similar to how the motor or a generator would. At first glance, this all seems a bit counterintuitive. I mean, the higher the load condition is, the faster the electrons are moving, right? But the faster the electrons move, we see the slower the motor wants to go. It's pretty weird, right? But there's a pretty logical and easy to understand explanation for this behavior. Let's recall these basic principles. The first, a magnet moving past a wire induces a current into that wire. And the second, a current moving in a wire creates a magnetic field. All pretty basic concepts that most people have learned about in school, I guess. But there's a third principle that's hidden in here, and one that most people are not usually thinking about, even though they understand the first two pretty well. And that is that, whenever the first principle happens, it must also cause the second principle to occur too. Now by combining them, we can say that moving a magnet past a wire induces a current into a wire, and then this current then creates a magnetic field. The strength of the magnetic field will always be relative to the amount of current being induced, and the polarity of the magnetic field is always opposing that of the original inducing magnet. And with this, we finally have the answer for these mysterious load or braking forces. It's simply the result of opposing magnetic fields that increase in strength relative to the rate of current flowing in the induced side of the circuit. In the case when the motor wires are not being shorted, or are just left open circuited, then a potential difference of voltage can actually be measured when the motor rotates. But as there is no circuit for the current to flow through, no opposing magnetic force will be generated to slow down the motor. So that's why the motor simply just spins freely. But when the motor wires are shorted, the current potential is at its maximum, causing a strong opposing magnetic force that will slow down the motor as it tries to spin. It also means the faster the motor is spinning, the greater the braking force will be. That's why we see the brakes work really well, even if the motor is spinning really fast. As for when the motor is actually stopped like this, it's actually a bit of an illusion. In fact, no braking force exists when there is no motion. It's only as we rotate the motor that some instantaneous high current loads are generated, and that in turn causes the pushback force that we feel here. So you can understand that by the inherent nature of this mechanism, it's simply not possible to get a hard locked braking state. It just doesn't work that way. I think in theory, this all seems to make sense, but let's actually check to see if this motor is actually generating any notable current when shorted out like this. So I've shorted out the two phases here, and I'll measure between that and this third phase, and we'll see what sort of current we get. Naturally, I'm measuring using uh, AC current mode. I'll give it a push. Yep, definitely something there. And now I'll give it a good shove. It looks like we can get a couple of amps even at these very slow speeds. I'm sure if it was running at speed, you could easily see many tens of amps being generated, and that would surely cause some serious braking forces. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I found this method of braking pretty interesting to figure out. It also gave me a chance to think about how generators work the way they do, and this also leads directly into the topic of regenerative braking as well. We can quickly deduce that regenerative braking must work by using charging of batteries as a way to create that high current load, and this in return is what's causing the braking forces. Naturally, charging batteries is inherently a dynamic load, so various methods must be employed to ensure a consistent braking force is maintained, and that's something I'm not going to go into here, but I think you get the basic idea of how it might work. So that's it for the braking discussion. Let's move on to the next section. All right, for this last bit, we're going to take a look at the signals that are being fed back into the microcontroller from, uh, from the motor. See if we can try to understand what's going on. 
I'll probably have to do a post analysis on the signals a little bit because you know just looking at here on the scope it's not going to probably occur to me straight away exactly what's going on let's have a look anyway so we have those uh, three signals which are being voltage divided down so the voltage dividers here one two three feedback signals that are going to this microcontroller and those are also being combined via uh, three resistors into a combined signal here so let's just take a look at what those signals look like and see if we can uh, at least just get an idea of what's going into the microcontroller and then we'll talk about it all right so we can see here that the amplitude so we can see here that the amplitude for each of those uh, is clearly a lot lower I mean it was like uh, 24 volts before and now it's down to 1 volt so they've divided it down to be quite low and it's pretty consistent across each of the three phases and this combined version here is really tiny right 20 millivolts amplitude I don't know if that's right but the uh, the scale is 500 millivolts so it's probably not right uh, it's probably all this noise and stuff confusing it so it looks like it's around about uh, yeah maybe about a volt as well something like that so it's not really changing it yeah it's just summing those three together so let me uh, stop the capture here so as I said we'll probably do a, a little bit of a post analysis on this after I get it on the desktop and have a look at what these singles are but you know there's nothing glaringly obvious I mean there's a few things that come to mind is that well this amplitude of one volt and this will probably be about one volt or so as well you know how is the microcontroller actually inputting that I mean if it's a um, if it was treating it as a logic based signal <laughs> a pretty noisy one at that uh, you would expect it to be exceeding 1.5 volts at least to get a high state and it's not even getting above that so so that means that you know either they're doing something that I don't understand uh, or they're using the analog to digital converter to pick up on these um, but again that that also you know maybe the analog to digital converter is really fast in this uh, microcontroller and I'm not very familiar with it and I, I guess that would work too if that was the case but you know when we're talking about the three phases you know the combined one you know all you can really see here is that if the motors uh, running or not I guess so you know if there's a, a constant amount of signal being there then you could say that the motor is, is running um, and on this side here you can see that uh, it's misshapen and we've seen in the other uh, capture as well the misshapen means that this there's some sort of um, effect of the coil uh, affecting the shape of this signal and it's I suspect it's likely that it's picking up on some, some aspect of the shape of the signal to decide the timing so you know I don't know exactly what that is uh, as I said I'll get it offline and we'll have a bit of a look and see if we can break it down a bit and figure it out now I was going to go through and see if there's anything else on this chip worth looking at but I think it's a bit of a waste of time actually um, I know that, that the voltage divider is here and feeding the voltage for the uh, for the battery in here and this other line here is most likely the external PWM control to uh, control the speed coming in here as well and other than that there's really not much to it so I think we'll just keep it at that for now let's get uh, those that capture information I've got uh, and see if we can do a little bit of post analysis yeah I mean it's not clean cut I mean that much I can say it's definitely not clean cut it's not like you know here's the position pulse <laughs> for the uh, for the motor clearly you know it's more complex than that uh, as far as the shape of this waveform is, is, as it's being shown all right oh, well, let's get on the computer and uh, see what we can figure out So after seeing those signals and, and obviously not really understanding what was going on, I decided to go back and have a look at the data sheet. And the first thing, looking at the pinouts, um, we can see that this PC2, PC3 and PC4, which is where those individual uh, sense signals are going, it says that it's got an ADC, and I think I've mentioned that earlier. It's possible that they're using an ADC to sense those very low voltages. You know, they're around about the one volt peak mark, so they're going to have to do something other than a, a purely logic level sort of analysis on it. So the first thought was that maybe that they're using the ADC to do some quick sampling on that. But, you know, the frequencies involved are very, very high, you know, to be able to get an accurate sort of read on it. So for me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. 
So if we have a look at page 189 on the data sheet, we can see some information about the analog to digital converter. You know, it's indicating of, uh, you know, maximum resolution of 15,000 samples per second. So, you know, across those three channels, having this running at maximum frequency, you know, you might, you might be able to get some sort of information, but the, the resolution is going to be way too low, I think, for, for the requirement. So there has to be another answer. So, you know, again, looking at the, the pinouts, we have to look at the next thing on the on the order, which is the the combined signal. Those three signals where they're combined together, which is an even lower. It's a slightly lower signal than the simple voltage divided signals. And we can see that on PD six, where it comes in here, it says it has A I N zero, and the only other similar pin like that is this A I N one, which is on PD seven. So, so there's something there that's interesting. And after a little bit of searching, I found if we look at page one eighty six here. I found that this uh, AIN0 and, and 1 here is actually going directly to a analog comparator. Now this makes a lot more sense. Um, but obviously AIN0 and AIN1 uh, you know, is not going to be useful because AIN1, that uh, PD7 pin, was actually being used as a control signal. So you know, the thing that came to mind is that they must be doing a comparison between those uh, analog ADC inputs and the... Uh, and this AIN or this combined signal and if we look at the next page actually we can see there's an analog comparator multiplex input which means that you can actually select on the negative side any of the ADC inputs to feed the uh, the comparator. Now look if you don't know what a comparator is it's very straightforward it's basically just comparing two voltages sort of like if you played Minecraft you'll know what that's all about um, and if one voltage exceeds the other the it will be converted to a logic state of being high or low. So it's just a simple way of comparing two voltages if one's greater or less than the other and converting that to a, to a high or low uh, logic status. And obviously that can happen at extremely high speed. So here this is a simple way to compare each of those signals. So, so it came to mind that what they'd be doing here would be likely effectively comparing each of those signals uh, one by one and then switching this um, the multiplex input uh, as the sequence uh, progresses. So it's a little bit tricky, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing. And I also noticed that this input has another, this analog comparator has another interesting uh, feature in this chip. And if we have a look at this page 86, there is this input capture unit. And this is quite interesting because what this does is it uses an external trigger, which can be the comparator logic, to snapshot a time where the change had occurred. So if you want an extremely high accuracy in timing, what you can do is you can have this um, input capture unit trigger uh, a time capture immediately at the point that the logic state changes. So you can see here that the, the timer counter feeds into this counter register. So as soon as that triggers, it will save the value. And that means you can calculate from that value how long ago it occurs and take very time accurate actions. So I suspect they're using this. And there's also another interesting feature in this functional block is that it has a noise canceller option as well. And that allows you to, um, it's sort of like a Schmidt trigger, right? It expects a number of consecutive directional changes before it actually accepts that as a logical high or low. It creates a little bit of delay, but it effectively filters out all the little noisy bits and pieces that come along with these types of signals. Let me butt in here to make some necessary clarifications. I know that a lot of you might be able to put together what I'm going on about here, but let me do a quick diagram just to make sure that it's absolutely clear. First we have the three voltage dividers connected to each of the motor wires, right? This ensures the microcontroller will only receive voltages within its operating range. And then we have this other resistor array, which is used to combine all the three signals, and then this is fed into the positive input of the comparator within the microcontroller. A switching array inside the microcontroller is then used to dynamically select which of the motor's sent signals are sent to the negative input of the comparator, and the output of this comparator goes through a filter to get rid of any noise. This filter works simply by waiting for four clock cycles of consistent state change before passing on that state change to the output. And then we have this clock capture mechanism. It will capture the current internal clock value at the point that the comparator changes its state. This will be whether it goes from low to high or high to low, depending on how it's configured at that specific instant. I expect the capture action will also be configured to trigger an interrupt so that the software can respond in a timely manner. The software will then pick up the clock value and it will use it to schedule the change to the next event. At the same time it's going to reconfigure the comparator so it's ready to capture the next expected event. And that's pretty much it, that's how this system sort of works. I can only hope it's a little bit clearer for at least some of you out there. 
Anyway, let's get back to what I was going on about before. Now, unfortunately, I can't really replicate comparator. I mean, I could, I could probably externally put a comparator and we could have a look at what the logic would look like as according to the way that the uh, microcontroller sees it. But that's a little bit difficult. So what I'm doing is I'm just subtracting each of the waveforms um, from, well, let me have a look just to make sure I understand that I've done here. So channel one is the, um, is the combined signal or all three signals combined together. It's a little bit of a lower level signal. Um, and I'm subtracting from it uh, each of the different waveforms. So I have three versions of that. So let's just take a look at that running and see what it looks like. Just to get a bit of an idea. Now, Comparator works a bit different. It doesn't just subtract. It's actually, you know, looking for the, the, the difference point. But in any case, it's sort of similar and it will give us a bit of an idea of roughly what might be going on here. and stop this so we can hear ourselves all right so the top signal as we discussed before um and i'm running the top signal at a slightly uh, zoomed in uh vertical resolution so it looks proportionally bigger than it actually is it should actually be half this size but this top signal here is the combined sense signals all those three signals combined together with that uh, network of resistors on the board there and the next signal is uh, we'll say it's uh the a channel and this is a differential signal, subtracting channel A from the combined signal. And this is basically what we get after it's filtered after a few cycles. And then channel B the same and C the same. Now, what you can see here is that we have a much more uh, useful looking signal as well. You can see that it's, it's a much cleaner signal. And what the comparator effectively will be doing is that it will be looking at a point, or it'll, you can draw a line through this signal here and there'll be a point uh, where it sees it going above a certain point and that will be the trigger point. And you can see that trigger point will therefore then follow the phase. Now unfortunately one thing I realized at the end of this production is that I forgot to do any signal capture for the startup sequence of the motor and the controller. Naturally, if we were talking about motors with sensors, you would always know the actual position of the rotor, and you could easily apply power at the right place to get things moving. Even from a dead stop, it's not a problem. But as I touched on earlier in this video, senseless motors require motion to determine the position. You effectively have a chicken and egg type problem to solve. Now, even without looking at the oscilloscope, I do know that the controller will have a startup sequence that first starts rotating the magnetic field blindly in order to try to cause some type of movement. And once sensible back EMF signals are detected, the switching will then change to sync with those signals. I would also expect that if sensible signals are not detected within a reasonable time frame, most ECs will likely just shut down with some type of error. Now of course this mechanism to try to start this motor blindly is going to be a problem if the motor is stopped with a high torque load, as that could lead to a jittery or possibly even a failed startup. Naturally the controller can use various strategies to try to avoid a fully stalled situation, but it's nearly impossible to totally avoid some degree of jumpiness under high torque startup cases. I guess this is why you pretty much always see sensors being used in brushless power tools where the startup torque is more often than not pretty high. So there you have it, we've finally made it to the end of this series. At some point in the future I expect that I will likely use the knowledge gained in this series to make some electromagnetic motors, actuators and related controllers. When I do I'll be sure to add those videos to this electric motivations playlist. And for those of you that have been intently watching this series, I believe there's about 20 of you out there according to the statistics, I send my sincere thanks. Personally, I've hugely advanced my knowledge as a result of making this video series, so in that sense, one of my primary objectives has been achieved. Of course, as always, another primary objective is to share what I've learned in these videos with the hope that this also helps someone out there. So if any of these videos was of some kind of use to you, then please consider liking, commenting, subscribing, and sharing. It costs nothing for you to do it, and I can assure you there's no profit in it for me either. But hopefully it will increase the chance that these videos will reach more people and give them a chance to learn the same as you just have. For my upcoming videos, I will likely be doing a mix of things as usual. Apparently having a mix of things is suicidal for a YouTube channel, but in any case, that's what I plan to stick with, so I hope people will stick with me too. I have a solar controller system project that I'm intending to build for my home, some motorbike related videos, some more mini lathe related videos, and I'm also thinking about reviewing some of my old historic electronic projects. I've also had a number of requests for some coding related tutorial type videos, so I'm going to create a series of videos related to that too. 
Now I was thinking to try to create those coding related videos in parallel with any other videos that I'm working on. So we're gonna to have to see how that all works out time and process wise. I also want to hear about what topics people really would prefer to see me cover. It's a difficult question I know, but if you have an idea, then please leave it in the comments for my consideration. Ultimately, I'll still only stick to doing things that maintain my interest, but where that aligns with what other people wanna see, I'll likely be motivated to cover those topics first. So thanks again for watching, and I do hope to catch you in the next video. See you then.